Welcome to another Can We Afford to Talk podcast. Today, I'm talking to Jeff Howard, who's been a documentary and editorial photographer for over 55 years. Welcome, Jeff. Hi. Have you always been based in London? Yes. Because I know your, a lot of your work focuses on East London and you've done, some, you've done a lot of travelling as well. Are you based in Rotherhide? No, no, I've never lived in Rotherhide. I've always lived in North London. Uh, my parents came to London from Northern Ireland just after the war and I was born here and I'm living in Muswell Hill now. It's about five miles from where I was born. I've always lived in London. What was the early fascination with Rotherhide? It was chance, really. I, as I explained in the introduction to the Rotherhithe book, I was at a, a party somewhere local to me, and I met a, a young couple, a brother and sister, who were friends of the one of the uh, one of the hosts. And they, I was talking to this guy Alan, and he invited me to come over and meet up. So I started going over there, and probably just as friends for a while. And one evening they said, we'll go to the local, which was uh, the pub called the Apples and Pears. And I just thought it was amazing. And I thought, I have to take pictures here. So I went back with them and I started shooting. After that, I, I kind of got interested in the, in the area, just sort of driving around. And I thought, I'll photograph here. It looks interesting. And that's how it started. That was, I met them probably in 1970 and I didn't start photographing there until about 73 and the bulk of the Rotherhide photography was done 1973 to 1975 and then I went to Africa and I had a break and I came back and I did more and it kind of, I, I felt sort of, I suppose towards the early 80s I thought I've done it the area is changing with all the Docklands redevelopment and lots of people were photographing in rather high I just thought you know that's it I've done it. Where was your North of Barnet book based around? It's just a title for a collection of pictures which were taken in vaguely the north you know when you drive up the A1 there's a sign that says to the north and the other part of that is the architectural critic Ian Nairn in a, I think it was a TV programme, talked about somewhere being north of Barnet. And I just thought it was a great line, very funny. And I just remembered that and I just chose that for the, for the title. Of course, yes. And I remember that because we spoke about this title a while ago, didn't we? I think we did, yeah. When you were asking me about when the Café Royal... That's zine right. came out yeah where was the main focus for north of barnet uh, there wasn't one it was just all sorts of places that i had been to really sort of north of london i suppose that's right yes yes i remember that now so there was ob an obvious attraction to the working man daily life what, what was the what was the attraction what was sending you in these places was it work you were getting commissioned who was your main sort of source of income at the time it it was various sorts of things. It was um, some of it was work. Yes, uh, I photographed in factories and industrial situations for uh, design companies and advertising agencies for a few years. Uh, that would send me to the to the Midlands certainly. Um, some of the pictures were just done. I was travelling. I had friends in in Halifax and I would go up and see them and sort of drive around um so yeah various various reasons what are you up to these days not doing a great deal uh covid knocked everybody sideways and uh put an end to to travel trying to go on a a, a big trip sort of every year and go back to Japan every year but haven't been able to do anything really. Uh, I've been sat in front of the computer. I've been scanning negatives from the 70s and 80s. Not quite sure what I'm going to do with them, but just sort of looking back what I've what I've done, finding all sorts of things in the contacts which have been overlooked. Um, is this a decent picture? Well, let's 
scan it and make a print and, and see. I'm working, um, trying to put together a set of pictures for a, a local history book. So that's been some of the scanning. What are you scanning your necks on? It's a, a Nikon um, 9000 multi-format scanner. Almost all my work is on 35mm, but I have been shooting medium format since, I suppose, the turn of the century. So I have a certain amount of um, 120 film as well. What medium format are you using? It's uh, a Rolly, Rollyflex, um, a Super Iconta, and a Fuji 645. What's your focus? What have you been shooting with that? The Rolleiflex stuff, I shot uh, a project in black and white on the hall. I, I can't really remember how this started. There's a wonderful building somewhere in the Midlands, somewhere in Leicestershire, I think it is, called Kirby Hall. It's a fantastic ruin, which English heritage have taken over and ruined by making it a friendly visitor experience, etc. But I, I photographed that um, before, and I, I got interested in the idea of the big house as a sort of focus for a community. And I just, more or less as an intellectual exercise, thought I will photograph about the hall, one roll of film, no more than two prints, not necessarily exactly about it, but something tangential that refers to it, and just see what I come up with. And I did this for a couple of years, and it was interesting, sort of again, travelling around the country and seeing these sometimes amazing buildings and sometimes ruins, and what can you find there, and monuments in the local church, a cafe, something like that, whatever. I was trying to sell this to some of the country magazines and the people were sort of interested and liked it but felt it's not quite right for them so that just sort of got put away. How's your style of? I've been shooting uh, a project about the English seaside uh, on medium format colour negative. I wanted to try and make pictures which were redolent of how I remembered seaside holidays to be as a child so it's probably not exactly a, it's not necessarily a true documentary because much of what you see these days isn't what I remember or what I'm particularly interested in. But the feeling of a traditional seaside holiday, families, that kind of thing. And that's been quite fun. Has shooting in medium format changed your approach on the way you shoot? Yes, I think so. I think that the kind of cameras that you shoot on determine to some extent the kind of pictures that you take. Uh, I like using the Rolleiflex, but I could never get used to the way things go backwards when you're panning or people are moving. And that's why I went on to the uh, Super Iconta, which is a beast of a machine, and then eventually to the, to the Fuji. And I certainly think that I shoot a different kind of picture on that to what I would shoot with uh, Leicas or Canons or something. Have you got a set of new influences photographically which has sort of helped change your format? I think so, yes. There's a Japanese photographer called Rinko Kaochi, whose work I think is amazing. I saw a slideshow at the Photographer's Gallery a long time ago I don't know if she was being published in England there at the time. And then I started to see her books. And I think her, her early first few books are absolutely wonderful. Although she's changed and it's perhaps less so now. I think it's become more sort of ordinary or perhaps you're getting just sort of more used to the, the way that she's seeing things. And it doesn't have that impact of uh, novelty. Can you take me back to the beginning? Can you take me back to the 60s when you were getting that calling to be a photographer. How did your life build up to that point? Right. You warned me you were going to ask this. <laughs> I've been thinking back. Okay. My father was a GP, a family doctor, and he was interested in all kinds of things. In the mid-50s, he bought a, an 8mm cine camera, make home movies with. 
so he also getting lots of uh, movie magazines, amateur film magazines, etc. And then that would sorry, he bought the camera in the mid fifties. Yeah, in the sort of mid sixties, one summer I was still at school. Summer holidays had finished. It was that kind of period of waiting to go back to school and bored. I came across all these pile of old magazines and I started looking through them and I just got interested in images because there was stills from movies and there was behind the scenes, uh, etc. I just thought some of the, this was interesting. I had an old Ensign 6x6 camera that my dad had given me and I started to take pictures and it developed from there. Eventually I started going around London on the bus and getting off places I'd never been and just sort of walking around taking pictures and it would be the mid 60s and things were not like they had been in the 50s and I decided that I wanted to be a photographer although at that point I had no idea really what kind of photography I was interested in. I got a, I left school and I got a job with a a wedding photographer in North London. Um, and I was never allowed to do actually weddings myself, but I did passport pictures and I printed a lot for him. And I did filing and stuff like that. And I bought my first Leica, an old Leica 3C for £25. And I got bored with, with what I was doing with him and I, I left and I, I worked for a couple of months in Dixon's behind the counter, Dixon's professional department in Oxford Street. They had hire department, what have you. And I saw, on a day off, I saw an exhibition of photographs in the local library and a sign said, work by students of the London College of Printing. And I thought, this looks quite good, uh, I'll go there. So I applied and I got in and uh, during my time there I got more interested in actual, I suppose, documentary reportage type photography. And so that's how it started. Who were your influences then? Fred Cook ran the uh, London College of Printing Photography Department and he, he asked me this at the interview and I was kind of stumped for anybody to say. And he said, well, I think I detect Cartier-Bresson here. And I thought, Cartier Bressel, I've heard that name, I must have seen some of his pictures. So I said, yes, yeah, yeah, probably Cartier Bressel. Um, certainly that was one of my early influences. But I also said Sanson, who was a Dutch photographer uh, who had just been killed in a car crash and Fred Cook had never heard of him. And I think that impressed him. So he said, I'll have to go and look him up. And then at college, I, I started to see I started to look at all sorts of books, uh, Shadow of Light and the Americans. Robert Frank was a, was a very big influence on me for quite a long time. But it, it, it was generally the humanist magnum photographers of the 50s and 60s, I'd say, with a strong touch of Robert Frank. Do you remember when you went to the interview for the London College of Printing what was in your portfolio? How did you present it? <laughs> I had a box of about a hundred whole plate prints because 10 8 was too expensive and the whole plate paper was cheaper. And it was all kinds of stuff. Um, there was no theme to it at all. It was just a box of loose prints from everything that I'd been doing for the previous, oh, what, year, year and a half, maybe. Uh, just random street stuff because walking about features in a lot of your work doesn't it like the Rotherhide stuff yeah there was a lot of sort of walking about stuff um there were informal portraits of friends um i'd been to um, a couple of trade shows where they had demonstrations so there was pictures of uh, fashion models posing it was a very very mixed bag do you think your progression and as a, as a photographer up to and after the London College of Printing was your education was this the way you were finding out about life almost accidentally in a way yeah you could say that yes yeah because 
sort of leaving school and meeting different sorts of people to whom I'd ever met before. Uh, yeah, it was an education in life, I suppose, certainly, yeah. It's sort of an, an ongoing one. You don't stop that. You're always, always learning. I can relate to the way you evolved and became a, a photographer, maybe quite by accident and without thinking of too many influences, because that, that's the way I moved into it. And purely hmm. out of a friend doing it and me loving the process and loving what I could do. And it was a bit later I realised wow, there's all these other people doing it. And that's when I sort of, that's when the world connected with me. I thought, I, I'm not on my own here. What happened after London College of Printing? Well, uh, I knew that I wanted to do editorial type photography. I wasn't sure whether or not uh, I could make a living doing this. But I, I left college and I started bringing up magazines and book publishers and going to show pictures, which in those days you could actually do. You could meet people and show work face to face and talk. And I started to get work and then met um, an art director in an um, um, advertising agency and started to get the, uh, as I say, industrial photography work, which was just done in a documentary type way you go to the factory and they show you around and shoot pictures with a natural light 70s oh, i've lost my thread where was i <laughs> yeah this would be in the this was in the 1970s um a few years i did this i did that for a, a few years and i got a bit bored with london and i some friends had moved to africa before johannesburg and i thought i'll go and visit so i I had money saved and I went to I went to Africa and I flew to Nairobi and went overland by local buses and hitchhiking down through Kenya, Zambia, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia and what was then Rhodesia into South Africa and I had a three month visa and I stayed there for three months um, just walking around, um, getting lifts out into the country and shooting pictures. And my visa ran out and I came back and it was the three day week and the advertising work had all disappeared and much of the editorial work. It was a bit difficult time for a while there. Did you take that style of shooting with you to Africa? Because I'm not aware of you, your your travels. Uh, into, I, I've seen the tr some travels in your work, but you must have amassed quite a body of work then, did you? Uh, yes, I, in those days I never sh I've never been a really heavy shooter um, and I didn't shoot as much as I should have done or as perhaps other people would do. Most of the pictures that you see from Africa tend to be, even then, it was colour and there was lots of wildlife and exoticism. I wasn't really interested in that. I was interested more in what it's actually like just being there, going through the cities and the towns. I was shooting black and white with Leicas and just what one came across on the on the travels. Do you think that travelling helped you with your work later on when you come back to England? No, I don't think so. Um, it was an interesting thing to do. It wasn't, on the whole, it wasn't a particularly pleasant time. I really didn't like South Africa. Uh, a lot of the people were pretty awful. So I don't think that it, I don't think so, no. I mean, I sold pictures to The Guardian and The Times and Camera Press. I've sold my pictures since 1970 and they sold a lot of stuff. But I don't think it had any influences other than that, no. When did you return? Uh, phew, it would, it would be sort of 1975 and it was probably, as I say, it was the, the three day week, whenever that was. Would it be sort of like March? 75 and then you jump back into your documentary of Rotherhide and London and you picked up work I presume again and started back in the grind of being a freelance yes yes um there was less work than there had been and I as I say the design company and the advertising work didn't really come back then I suppose Thatcher came in and um 
the world started to change, England started to change. Colour was the preferred medium. You had to be shooting colour. Who were your main clients in the 70s? Right. Well, after leaving college, one of the the main clients was the IPC magazine group, in particular the women's magazines, uh, Woman, Woman's Own, Woman's Journal, Honey, 19, for younger, well, that kind of thing. I worked for New Society. I worked for the AA for their magazine Drive. Uh, I worked for the Reader's Digest books. Uh, I photographed pop music at the Rainbow Theatre for um, some music magazines. And as I say, uh, Leo Burnett's and J. Walter Thompson's doing industrial industrial stuff. After sort of after the late seventies, after coming back from Africa, the that design company, advertising work, finished. And there was there was just less magazine work altogether and times were a bit difficult. But you keep going. You have a number of pictures in the archive of the National Portrait Gallery and and I stumbled across the photograph you took of Martin Parr. Hmm. Boy did I chuckle. What a picture of Martin <laughs> Parr that is. And what's interesting about that is he just looks so different but if anybody wants to check the link out, I'll put the link in the comments section of the of the podcast information. But what interests me and what made me chuckle about that picture wasn't his suit or his badges. It was the two girls checking them out. <laughs> Tell me the story yeah. of that shot, please. Okay. Um, there are various country customs happening up and down the land, specific day things. Homer Sykes, who's a very good friend of mine, has been photographing these since college days. And there's another photographer called Brian Shule who'd also been doing it. I met Brian at some event and he invited me to come and have dinner and eventually said, use my dark room whenever you like. And he had he was going up to uh, Bake Up and Midgley and places in uh, West Yorkshire for a couple of customs at Easter. And I went with him just for the ride and see what you can find and what you can do. And Martin Parr and Daniel Meadows were just out of college and they were living in Hebden Bridge, or Martin was living in Hebden Bridge, I don't know about Daniel. And they had come along for these events as well. And you get chatting, etc. I just, I just saw Martin standing there, and I thought his, his Norfolk jacket or whatever was very stylish, and shooting with a Leica with a with the ever ready case. He was a nice guy. I didn't realise quite how determined and professional, and he was going to end up being a superstar. So I knew I knew Martin when he wasn't famous. But I slept on his sofa in Hebden Bridge once or twice. The two girls checking him, checking him out, though, is just makes me chuckle every time I look at that picture. It's very 1970s. And, the, yeah, I mean, there were these people who were obviously not local taking pictures, so I think a certain amount of attention. And who are the other portraits of? Are they writers? Gosh, uh, who to think? There's an art, uh, artist, Tess Jarray, there's the one at the top of the uh, National Portrait Gallery page. She's an artist. That was done when I was at college. Uh, one of our tutors was the photographer George Lewinsky, who spent a lot of time photographing British artists, and he continued doing that when he was uh, tutoring at the LCP. And he would take one or two students with him to to these sessions, and so I, I photographed Tess Jarret. All the others would have been done for magazine commissions. Alan Corran there was done for Nova magazine. He was a really nice guy. And uh, he requested a print at no charge, because that's what our budget is at Punch magazine, of him for his column on how to be trendy, because he liked the trendy striped shirt he's wearing. I can't remember what else he's there now. Uh, the philosophers, the three philosophers, A.J. Ayer, um, 
Bernard Williams and Anthony Quinton. This was a commission for the from the BBC. BBC books I did quite a lot for over the years. It had been a series of interviews for TV with famous philosophers, meaning of life, etc. And they decided to to publish the transcripts as a as a book and I was asked to take the photographs of all the ones in England. So th that's how that came about. Uh, Stephen Woolley's a film producer and that was done for a Japanese magazine. Kenneth Grange, the uh, designer, that was done for a, a Japanese magazine. The interviews, pictured to go with interviews. So you've travelled a lot to Japan. Uh, Japan is featured in a self-published book as well. How did you come about travelling so much to Japan? I've been going to Japan since 1984. Most years, sometimes a couple of times in a year. I worked it out the other day. I spent more than a year and a half in Japan, but it's been over 25 years or so. I met uh, a young woman who we became a couple, and uh, when she had to go back to Japan, I decided I was going to go there as well. So I did, and we are now married and have been for whatever it is, however many years. So we go back, she has family there still, and um, so we have a base near Tokyo, and originally by myself, and then later on together, we would get rail passes where you can go anywhere in Japan for a fixed, a fixed ticket. Uh, just to go, that sounds an interesting place, I'll go there and go there and walk around and look and see. You said a book about Japan. Uh, Japanese in, Mormons. Yes, 1991. I reckon that the first serious pictures I took that I'll, I'm still pleased with were in 1966. And so 1991 marked 25 years photographing. I wanted to mark the occasion and I thought I'll, have a, I'll make an exhibition of Japanese pictures. Uh, just come back from or not just sort of over New Year, Christmas, New Year, 1989, 1990, I spent in Japan, so 1991. And uh, I found this Smith's Gallery and, in Covent Garden, and they were uh, having an exhibition of a Japanese painter's work downstairs, and they had a smaller gallery upstairs, which they said that they would hire to me at a, a reasonable rate. And I talked to Canon, Canon professional, a woman, Jane Harvey, I was quite friendly with, and she said that they, they'd help sponsor it. And it was all systems go, and it's 50 pictures, half color and half black and white. Shortly before it was due to go on, Canon pulled out because they had other commitments sponsoring the um, Japan Festival. And they, could, they felt they couldn't do my show as well. But it was so close to the time, I thought, well, I'll just pay for the rest of it. So that was the exhibition, which was um, only on for 10 days, I think. And when print on demand and blurb became a thing, I remembered this exhibition and I thought it'd be nice to have something permanent from that. And so I produced the book Japanese Moments as a kind of after the event catalogue of that show. The Six English Towns you did, that was a book. Tell me about The Six English Towns. OK, Six English Towns was a commission from the BBC. Uh, they were making this series of uh, one hour programmes with a guy who, uh, Alec Clifton Taylor, who was a, an architectural historian, and they had pretty well finished. I think they were actually shot it all and it was in editing. They decided that they would like to do a book, and I was commissioned at sort of fairly short notice to, to go and photograph. And I had a shot list from them of the buildings he was talking about, uh, and that's the first volume came out. Um, then a few years later, it had been quite popular, I suppose, and they, they decided they were going to do another one, and I did a second volume for them. But I had a much longer shot list because they, they worked it out. They were going to do a book from the beginning, 
And then again, a few years later, they did a third series and the same thing, except that some of that time I went round with the film crew while they were shooting it. And you've had an, um, quite a mix of commercial work as well, haven't you, on your journey? You've done a lot with dance and ballet? Yeah. Uh, before I went to college, I suppose this would be, yeah, it would have been before I went to college. I look, I've always looked at magazines and books and I came across a series of articles in the Amateur Photographer magazine, which had been written by George Lewinsky, as I mentioned before, talking about photographic style and photographic aesthetics. And one of them, one of the pictures was, I thought it was a wonderful picture of Royal Ballet dancers in a rehearsal studio. And it's a black and white picture. One of the girls is making a pose and in her outstretched hand, she has a cup of tea. I thought it was wonderful. From a, a book Michael Pito had done called The Dancer's World. And I, I thought, this looks like a, a great sort of occasion, these kind of situations for doing doing pictures. And so when I was at college, I end of the first year project, you could choose whatever you wanted. And I said to one of the tutors, I'd like to photograph ballet. And she knew somebody who was a, in the office at a ballet, small ballet company, and they arranged it. And I went and photographed uh, the Minerva Ballet in Brent, I think, Brent Town Hall, whatever. And I, I got interested, again, still at college. I read a, a dance review in the Times newspaper about a ballet company who were dancing to a variety of music, including Procol Harum, which is a band I always liked. And I thought, let's go and see. So I went to the Janetta Cochrane Theatre in Hoban and I spoke to the director, Alexander Roy, said basically just, can I come and take some pictures? And he said, yes, sure. And so I photographed them there and became friends with them. And I spent 10 years or so photographing the company in the rehearsal studio in uh, Swiss Cottage and in theatres around the country when they toured. And in fact, I went on tour with them. They used to tour actually eventually all over the world. They toured a lot in Europe and I went on four or five tours with them, which would be sort of two or three weeks each, touring around primarily France, um, France and Switzerland. And it was, it was sort of like the life on the road with a rock band kind of thing, a small company uh, driving between towns, arrive, unload the van, set up the stage in the theatre, trying to remember my schoolboy French to talk to these uh, stagehands and say, look, could you smooth that over there for a moment? Things like that. And the dancers would relax and do their class and exercise, a bit of rehearsal, and then you do the show in the evening and crash out. And the next day you drive off your 300 kilometres or whatever to the next town. It was great fun. You must have quite an archive from that. It's also featured in the Photographer's Gallery, Whitechapel Art Gallery. It's been around this work, hasn't it? Yes, uh, I have. I have quite a lot of material, ballet material, and if I had spent that much time photographing the Royal Ballet, I would probably be a famous dance photographer and not done much else. So variety is variety is a good thing. The the dance pictures, I have so much, I I cannot get myself round to editing that into anything comprehensive, into something organised. But Christina Roy, um, the Alexander Roy Ballet Company, Christina put together a, a dummy book. She just typed out various texts, her writing her thoughts about my photographing the company and stuck in uh, prints or photocopies, etc bound the whole thing up with a green silk ribbon and sent me this, which is very kind of it. It's a wonderful thing. And I I put this on a copy stand and I copied it and I I made a, a replica. Again, I, I published a couple of dozen copies with blurb just to give dancers and to give Christina. I sent her back her original. It should be in their archives, which have ended up in the um, National Theatre Museum. 
I think you should definitely do something with that. And I keep saying that one day I'm going to organise properly a, 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 because it was her choice of pictures. I keep saying one day I'm going to do my ballet book the way I want, but I, I don't know if I ever will. I don't think I can do it. Why? There's too much work. I, I, I cannot see how to organise and select this. I, I need somebody to give me a, a very strong hand with the editing. OK, that might be something I'm interested in doing. We'll talk about that at some point. I think when I think when you have a lot of when you have a lot of work on a particular subject, it's often very difficult to to make a proper edit. Um, the the, the Rotherhithe book I could I could I could do that because I I had help from a guy called Peter Goldfield at an early stage, and then I had the show at the Whitechapel Art Gallery. So the bones of that. Rather high project were organised at that point, and when I came to to doing the the book about it, that's what it built on. But the ballet stuff is just it was even longer shooting than than rather high. And yeah, <laughs> what you're looking at in terms of contact sheets, how much have you got? I don't know. I I really haven't counted. <laughs> It was primarily, it was almost all, sorry, just to say it was almost all black and white. Uh, I did shoot colour, uh, colour transparencies um, some of the time at their request and uh, also uh, later just for myself because I was shooting much more colour and to have something different. So you must have a few hundred contact sheets. Oh, I would think so, yeah. <laughs> I have two filing cabinet drawers, chock-a-block with contact sheets, and there is also quite a lot of material I don't have contacts for over the years. Uh, you gave them to clients and never got them back and just didn't get round to making another set, etc. What are you doing with your archives long-term future? Have you thought about where it's going to go, what you're going to do with it? That is the worst thing you could ask me. It keeps me awake at nights. What do I do with it? I don't know. Um, most of the my friends and colleagues who are photographers are in a similar position. We have all this material. What do you do? I don't know what to do about my archive. I don't want to just put it under the bed. Uh, there are a limited number of places which would be interested in taking it. And I suppose at some point when I'm organised enough, I hope to approach the VNA or somewhere and see if they would be interested in taking it. The Theatre Museum have certainly said that they would be interested in taking all the dance pictures, all the dance work, but I would prefer if possible to keep things together. Again, the museum in Docklands would quite like to have all the rather high stuff, but I'd like to try and keep it all together if I can. Well, before somebody else starts sifting through your dance work, that's a good incentive to do it. Do you not think? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, in some ways, I, I would be happy enough to have somebody, if I could trust them, to do it for me. Let me take you back to 1973. Yeah. Young British photographers at the Serpentine Gallery. Yes. Tell me about that exhibition. Who featured in it? What did you have in the exhibition? In 1973, uh, I was involved with two exhibitions. One was the Serpentine one, and one was at the ICA. The Serpentine was, it was a big show. It was about 70 photographers, I think. And everybody had just a few pictures. I think I, think I had some pictures from my trip to the United States in 1972, I suppose it was and possibly pictures from Ireland, but I honestly don't remember. There was a lot of photographers in it. Um, I'd have to go and get the catalogue and look to tell you. I remember Colin Kerwood was in it. Um, Colin's a good photographer, a friend of mine. We met in Ireland on the top of Crow Patrick, the Holy Mountain, which was another Café Royal zine, actually. Was, yeah. That's right, yeah. I was just going to move on to the Café Royal mm. books in a minute. Tell me how the Café Royal books came about. Café Royal, uh, Homer, Homer Sykes had done a number of these and I think maybe he suggested that I should show some work to 
uh, Craig at Cafe Royal. He might be interested. And I had fairly recently done the uh, My Rather Hive book, and I thought that's a ready scanned set of pictures. They might be interested in that. It will be a wider distribution than I managed. And I made contact with him and sent him some pictures. And he said, yes, fine, I'd love to do a rather high book, make a set, however many it was, 24, 27, whatever it was. Uh, and he also said that he liked to do three or four books from a from any particular photographer because it gave a, a better sense of their work. So I, thinking through my archives, what else have I got? And I... So I came up with the pictures outside London, which became north of Barnet. And I had a set of pictures of couples and parties and things like that, which became uh, recreation and romance in London, yeah. And this was 2014, wasn't it? Because you had north of Barnet, recreation and romance, and rather hide. Okay, they were all done in the same year. And the, the the last one, the fourth one, was the Crow Patrick, Holy Holy Mountain in Ireland. Yeah. And you had Rather Hyde London in 2014 as well. Yeah, that was the first one. Yeah, and so it was then four. Th that was the four. And then, oh, would it have been 2016 or 2017? 2017 was Rather Hyde London with Peter Gazing. Yeah, yeah. Peter Gazy, never a professional photographer, keen amateur. He he used to live there. He bought the book and he was interested in how the place had changed. So he went round photographing various locations from my book, trying to find the angle, etc. And he got in touch and we met up and uh, decided that it would be quite a nice thing to do an exhibition. And he knew some people at uh, an organisation called Time and Talent, in Rotherhithe who agreed to put on the show and cover the costs and I approached Craig at Cafe Royal and said how would you feel about doing uh, another another book which we can use as a kind of catalogue and he, again he's fine with that so that's how the 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 second Rotherhithe zine came out. I do love the Holy Island Cafe Royal book I think you and Martin Parr, the only two photographers I've seen do that. Ah, uh, no, no. Can I? I'll just stop you there. Colin Kerwood, as I say, I've mentioned. Um, I met him on the top of the mountain. He had been in the Serpentine exhibition in 73, so I knew the name. And he'd been in Creative Camera magazine in its good days, so I knew some of his work. 73, I went to Crow Patrick, and I didn't actually shoot that much. I didn't... I don't think I spent much time there, so I determined in 74 I was going to go back and do it properly. And I did, and that was the pictures, and I had a big spread in the British Journal of Photography. And when I was on the mountain, Colin came up and said, I've run out of film, can you lend me a roll of film? So I lent him a roll of tri -X. and we later became friends. Colin self-published a, a book of pictures of Ireland, Holy Ireland, no, it's called... Religious Goods, Teas and Refreshments, which was a sign over a, uh, over a souvenir shop. And he self-published that. Colin self-published uh, that book in the, well, I suppose he did it in 1974, 75 kind of time, at a time when self-publishing was rather more serious. There was no print on demand. You actually had to do the whole thing, um, designer and what have you, and arrange for a printer. Colin made, it was quite a nice book, there's some nice stuff in it. And he said he had some of them under the bed for some years, it took quite a long time. Distribution of self-published work is always the problem there. Uh, Chris Killips photographed on Crow Patrick. Yeah, um, he did a book about Ireland and Crow Patrick appears in that. Um, Caldelka, Joseph Caldelka, obviously famous pictures, and he was there the same year as I was, I think. Can it have been the year after? I don't remember now. You'd have, one would have to check that. Thinking back, this, I've seen quite a bit hmm. by other photographers. Was it Kenneth O'Halloran did some stuff as well? His was colour. Don't know that name, no. Uh, Colin uh, started out as a general editorial photographer, the same as myself and various others. 
uh, he was interested in motorcycles and cars and he got sidetracked and became a car photographer and one of the top car photographers in the country. Uh, he's pretty well retired now and I don't think I don't think he's shooting a great deal professionally and he's not his websites disappeared so I don't think there's much about him on the on the net. Well I think he did a wonderful job on the Holy Island thing it was really sort of mystical it's just this mystical land. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, with the fog and everything, yeah. The weather helped. It's an amazing place. I don't know as it would be the same now. The first time I went in 73, the main pilgrimage was at night and there's no lighting up there. You had to take a torch or trust to a clear sky and maybe a bit of moon. And it was, it was positively lethal up there on that shale. And they decided it was just too dangerous and that was 73 was the last year that they did it at night and that's probably why I didn't have many pictures because I I don't think I had a flash gun. 74 they 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 moved it to the daytime and the weather was as you can see in pictures it was misty and this great expanse of rural island with no no lights or sign of human habitation it was great yeah it's still very dangerous and people did still fall and injure themselves uh, but it, it was nothing like doing it at night. Your recreation and warm in 70s London that's just capturing people in situ, kids playing football, kissing on the park benches in London whereabouts is this is all just different parts of London is it? Yeah well it's, it's, all, it's all in North London it's sort of around my my manor I suppose um, pubs that I used to go to people I knew in their houses the streets walking around there yeah dirty life I always love social club shots I love oh yeah bars and entertainment they just offer yeah. so much in characters and situations that one of the the old guy singing is just wonderful <laughs> uh -huh. What's your favourite yeah. shot out of all of this? Which shot really resonates with you? Oh, heavens. I would have to look back through the book and see if I can make a decision. I don't know. There's too many. I like a lot of stuff. I, I, didn't, I wouldn't want to put anything in for one of those zines that I wasn't sort of confident about. You don't want to put in anything you think, well, that's a, a good filler, but not more than that. I want to put stuff I'm happy with. I love the shot of the chap asleep in front of the metal shutters in a sort of backyard it looks quite sinister he's not asleep he's drunk and passed <laughs> out and then you've got the kids um kissing and cuddling in the park and the young guys the young guy the young chaps playing football on the street yeah i wondered if you'd ask about that the, the kids playing football the cars look so small and there's hardly any of them yeah, <laughs> yeah. times have changed I was going to talk about the kids playing football. In the background, there is a guy smoking. He's wearing a white shirt, looking towards the camera. This is uh, a photographer called Stuart Goodman, who I met at school. We were friends from the School Photographic Society, and we kept in touch ever since. And for some reason, he and I were going down to Caledonian Road, and this is just in a back street there, and I saw the kids playing football. Stuart with his brain somewhere else just sort of walked into the shot and it was unfortunately the best shot it would have been better without him or if he hadn't been looking at me he'd have been <laughs> looking at the kids more etc but it, I, it's okay it's, it stands and I, I mention this because Stuart my good friend died from Covid just at the beginning of it um, beginning of what April 2020 sorry to hear that so that's a kind of a, a memorial for him Tell me about that ice cream van on the cover of North of Barnet. <laughs> I was an ice cream man briefly as a student. Oh, we, really? We, we, do, <laughs> we do these things as students when we're on our summer yeah. vacation. Tell me about that ice cream van and how that came about. I was up in uh, West Yorkshire, uh, Halifax, I suppose, with, with uh, friends, and I decided I was going to go to Preston of Easter. There was a tradition of children rolling Easter eggs and I thought let's go and have a look and that is in the park in Preston where they did it and it was quite early in the morning and it's just the mist and I was wandering around trying to find where these kids were rolling their eggs and there was the ice cream van and the 
chappy with his dog and it looked kind of incongruous who in that weather would be buying ice cream I thought it was funny I, I just took a couple of frames I love that shop it's a very surreal shop thank you I do too so who are your influences now who do you look at now who inspires you difficult question I don't know I'm I'm not sure if anybody much does other than my earlier influences, Cartier Bresson, Gary Winogrand, um, Robert Frank. You're a street photographer at heart, aren't you? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I like, oh, all those French guys, Willy Ronis, Izzy's, Duano. Um, there's a, a wonderful book called The Eye of Love by René Grobley, a Swiss photographer. I don't know, do you know that? I'll have a look. No, it's, it's fantastic stuff. The guy, uh, Swiss, as I say, he, he went, he and his wife went to Paris for their honeymoon in the late 50s, maybe it was. Yeah. And he took a lot of pictures and he published the, this book called The Eye of Love, which is, it's a classic. It's, it's wonderful. It's so, uh, so tender and gentle and romantic. I get, I'm trying to overcome my innate romanticism all the time, I suppose. Try and stick to a bit more reality. If you want to know influences, here's another one. Um, a Japanese photographer called Masahisa Fukase, who did a book called Ravens. Oh, yeah. Again, a famous work. Beautiful. And I, I bought another of his, his books uh, called Yoko, about his wife in the early 80s, before I'd seen the, the Ravens book. And I thought this was... Again, it's wonderful stuff. It's quite surreal in, in right. places. Odd, jokey. You got a first edition? And yeah. Of Ravens? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have the first American edition. I first edition of the American version. And I have the uh, Steedle reprint. Are you an avid collector of photo books? I, I don't say I'm a collector, but I do have an awful lot of photo books. Um, I have, yeah, I mean, I have a first edition of Shadow of Light. Um, I have uh, Philip Jones Griffith's book, Vietnam Inc., when it was in the original paperback. Wow. I have a first edition of um, Flash Up by, uh, what's the chappie's name? I've forgotten. Japanese photographer. He died recently. Really astonishing stuff. If you like social situations like pubs and bars, you should check him out. Flash Up, it's called. And he shot pictures in Tokyo, um, Flash, in the early oh. 70s, in all sorts of dubious dives. He photographed car accidents in the street, a bit like um, Ouija. Yeah. It was great, really old stuff. So, apart from sorting your dance archive out, and what's next? <laughs> what's next for you? Have you got any ideas? You shoot, you're uh, going to go out and shoot something? I, I, or what, what's, what's the sort of future? In the immediate term, I, I, I don't have any ideas. I'm waiting until we can travel again. Uh, I went to Nepal in 2018 and we'd originally intended to go to India as well but had to knock that on the head I'd still like to go to India but I wouldn't want to do it until I feel a bit more safe about traveling in that kind of sure. situation and I want to go back to Japan obviously but I don't have anything in the immediate do you still have the urge and the passion to take pictures I think I do uh, it's I I, I have felt constrained with the COVID and I have done very little in the last couple of years, but I do still, I do still carry a camera whenever I go out and I do still take snaps of what I come across. It's still there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I still want to shoot. It's still there. Absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah. Jeff, it's been a, a pleasure and I've really enjoyed finding out about you and learning from you as well. You're very kind. Thank you. Uh, you've got an awful lot of editing to do there. <laughs> on myself I think it's been wonderful wonderful and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and finding out about your dance archive let's get this done interesting do. and historical body of work yeah. and I look forward to seeing that in a book thank you Jeff and I wish you well thank you very much pleasure take, take care
Bye bye. Goodbye. We are floored, we are bound down, see us, careless corpse, see us, steel dawn, we are storm. We are storm. See us born, see us wind down, see us fly low to our blind goal. We are the storm.